I'm here with legendary retired detective Joe Coffey from such cases as Son of Sam, John Gotti, and he comes from a time when men were men. Detective, thanks for being here with us. Thanks for having me. So tell us, give us an insight into what your father was like. My father was a unique guy. When my brother and I were kids, we were very good athletes, and uh, he wanted me, I was the oldest boy, to go into boxing. He loved boxing. And in fact, he took me to the fights from the time I was, right after the war, from the time I was like seven years old. So, and he actually put me in a ring, and I had one fight, and I said, this is not for me. So my athletic career was football and baseball and basketball. My brother was basketball. So, but he never saw us play one game because his interest was totally boxing. And we loved boxing also, so we went to the fights with him. But he was, the, when I say a unique guy, he started out, when he was nine years old, he got run over by a horse. And he wound up in a hospital. It was the only time he was in a hospital from the time he was born until he went into the hospital for what he died from, which was an aneurysm in his aorta. So for the whole, my whole lifetime, he was never in a hospital which was kind of unique in those days because the advances in medicine weren't there. And is there a quality that he had that you wished you had more of? Yes, yes, no question about it. One that comes to mind in particular is patience. A lot more patience than I have, and he was just a nice man. I mean, this guy was uh, somebody to look, look up to. And I was, when I was a little kid, I thought he was the tallest man in the world. He was 5'11", right? And I turned out to be 6'4", sort of my brother. But when you look up and you really love what you're looking at, and you're looking up at him, you say he's seven feet tall. And so much of father-son relationships, sometimes it's nonverbal. Sometimes you just pick up cues. Are there things that you got from him on how you carry yourself or how you present yourself? Yeah, my father, I'll give you an example. My father is, uh, some people would call it a fetish for being neat and clean all the time. We lived above a Chinese laundry when we lived in Queens. And for him to get down and pick up his shirts, which was right downstairs, he would put on a suit and tie and a hat. He was like, how would you say it? Uh, fastidious is the word, I guess, about his dress. And I seem to have gotten that also on sort of my brother. And hopefully my kids have it, which they do. But uh, my father, he used to tell, he used to tell us that uh, of course, his parents were born in the United States. They weren't born in Ireland. My mother's parents were born in Ireland, but his parents were born here. So when I went to grammar school and I started to learn American history, we learned about Plymouth Rock and the Mayflower. And my father used to tell me and my brothers and sisters, sister, that uh, his grandparents came over on the Mayflower. But I said, Daddy, that was 1620. He says, they were real old. What would you say that your father's biggest accomplishment was? Well, number one, raising the children he raised, because everybody turned out to be uh, pretty successful. And, but the, the main thing that he did in his professional life was he started out, he was born in 1907. So he was uh, a depression uh, adult, really, because the depression was in the late 20s, early 30s, went right to World War II. So he drove beer trucks during Prohibition for an Irish gangster named Oni Madden here in New York, up to the Canadian border and back. And, and it was a lucrative business, you know, he would get, to, and he used to tell me how he had to pay off the cops all the way down from, uh, from Canada to New York City. And they gave him money up front to pay the cops off on the way down, because they'd just wait for them. And lo and behold, I became a cop later in life, and he always told me, don't take any money from these bastards. <laughs> but uh, what happened after Prohibition ended, he went to uh, work at Gimbel's and Macy's and Saks, driving delivery trucks for them. Then the United Parcel Service came into being, and he was right there at the beginning of it. When they founded, a guy named Philip Carey founded the United Parcel Service, and my father was one of the first drivers he hired from Gimbel's and Macy's. And as a result of that, he was a charter member of Local 804 of the Teamsters Union, which is to this day representing United Parcel Service drivers all over the world. My father, when he was a driver, I was his helper sometimes when I was a young cop. And at that time, UPS only delivered to Manhattan. Not like it is today all over the world with UPS, air freight and everything else. Then it was just Manhattan. They were all electric trucks, except for their furniture trucks. And uh, I used to wait for him on the corner, sit on the curb, because his garage was two blocks down the street from where we lived. 
on 3rd Avenue, 38th Street. So I'd sit on the car curb waiting for him. He'd pick me up in the truck. This is when I was like eight years old. And we'd drive to the garage, he'd turn the truck in, and he'd walk me home. It was a great time. Very vivid memories. You know, I, I think so much about my father and Father's Day. Do you still think about your father a lot? Every day. Every day. Well, first of all, I think of him every day because of how much respect and love I had for him. But you can't miss him because the United Parcel trucks are all over the streets. <laughs> That's funny. And, uh, and you know, you, you, had, you had a career and a life full of danger and adventure and, and accomplishment. How did he help prepare you for that? Well, it was 100% because of him why I became what I became. In 1946, in October of 1946, he was very active in organizing the United Postal Service to become a union, and the Teamsters Union. And as a result of that, the mob tried to take it over, tried to take over that operation and get in on the ground floor of that local. And he resisted, and his people on the executive board, who were charter members of Local 804, resisted. So one day in October, my mother was pregnant with my younger brother, and we're coming back from the AP. Uh, grocery store, and it's my mother, my father, and myself, and we go into our tenement building on 3rd Avenue and 38th Street, and as we walk in, we're on the staircase, and there was a bulb at the top of the staircase, which the reflection looked like we were right in front of the door. Two shots rang out on my father's side, but they missed them because we were on the staircase already. So he knew what was coming because he knew the danger what he was involved in. He threw me down on the stairs and jumped on top of me, my mother ran up to the payphone at the top of the stairs. In those days, we didn't have phones in our homes. We had them in the hallway. And she called this mob guy, they know in Florida, outraged, and the hit was called off after they missed. So because of that, at eight years old, I started to read every book I could get my hands on about the mob. And I think I've read every book to this day regarding the mob, going back to a book called The DA's Man. And ironically, my first job in the New York City Police Department as an investigator was in the Manhattan DA's office, which that book was about. And it's because of my father I became what I became. Uh, and what was your favorite thing to do together? My favorite thing I used to love to go to the fights with my father, because his personality changed like that at ringside. Quiet, unassuming man, always well-dressed, but at the fight, yelling and screaming, you know, four-letter words, the whole routine. I learned a few words from him also. But the fights were great. And do you have a favorite memory of your father? Uh, there's a lot of them, but the thing I most remember about him is how kind he was to people. Even though he lived a rough and tumble life and a rough and tumble business, he was always, always kind to everyone, including us and my mother. And you're a father, you're a grandfather. What do you think the way he was as a dad is something that your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren should try to, uh, to try to imitate? Well, my children, especially my daughter, because she knew my father better than anyone because she was the oldest. I mean, she has fond memories of him too. She remembers purposely messing his hair up on the couch because she knew that he hated to have his hair messed up. So he used to climb up behind her when she was like two and mess his hair up. And she had giggled, had giggled, you know, the whole routine. But he, he was a man, his father and mother died 10 days apart. And they died just after I was born. So I don't have too many memories of his father, but I have plenty of memories of my father. So Father's Day is this weekend. How do you plan to spend the holiday? Well, first of all, I'm going to play golf with my son. And then I'm going to have dinner with my wife. Well, thanks for sharing your thoughts on Father's Day. Father's Day is more about just this generation. It's about generations.